This is Autoline After Hours with John McElroy and Gary Vasilash, episode 550 for April 1st of 2021. Automotive design and the shape of things to come. Watch Autoline After Hours live at Autoline.tv every Thursday at 3 p.m. Eastern Time. That's 12 p.m. Pacific. You can subscribe to this podcast for free by searching for AutoLine in iTunes, Stitcher, or YouTube. AutoLine After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires, solutions for your journey, and by Magna. Hello, Gary. John, how are you? I'm doing well, as I always so- am. So, so this show is not going to be a giant prank, is it? No, no, no. Even just, though it's an a... April Fool's Day, this exactly. is not an April Fool's show. Yeah, mm-hmm. we're just going to be talking about cars and design, and we got a couple of good guests coming on here. So I was looking out the window earlier, and it was snowing, and it is opening day here in Detroit. So, Yeah, it's, it's, opening it's, day for baseball, and uh, it should be, I mean, come on, why are they doing it now? They They should push this back a month. So that when the stadium opens, it's a nice, warm, sunny day. I've been to opening day over the years, and sometimes I've been in shorts, and other times I've been in my long underwear. <laughs> Today would be a long underwear day. Okay, so so here's here's a, here's a here's a quiz for you. Okay. Okay. So on April seventeenth, nineteen sixty four. Yeah, the the Mustang was introduced. Ah, oh, darn! I thought you were going to ask. Try, try. No, I no, knew no, that. No, one. no, 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 no. Just, just wait. Just yeah. wait. We're going to yeah, get yeah, there. Yeah. Okay. But on April first, a car that that clearly does not get the respect it deserves was introduced, and it's in some ways analogous to the to the Mustang. April first of what year? This year, nineteen sixty four. Oh, nineteen sixty four. So Ooh. a couple of weeks before the Mustang was introduced. Huh. And I know I'm, our two guests, our two guests are, you know, they already have the answer. Yeah, they, they probably already do. I, I, so I'm going to guess, because I have no idea, the AMC Marlin. Well, actually, in 1970, April 1st, the AMC Gremlin was introduced, but that's not it. <laughs> but, but you were close. The Plymouth Barracuda. Oh, Okay. That's it. Yeah, I, I should have known better. I think the, the Marlin was out in 63, not 64. And uh, I should have known. Nah. But yeah, Plymouth Barracuda. And, you know, there's been rumors that they're going to bring it back, not as a Plymouth because the Plymouth <laughs> brand is gone. But there's been rumors that they'll bring back a Barracuda. Why? Why do they have a gray iron foundry? To make money. <laughs> okay, there you go. Although, if we do talk about numbers, because the sales came out today, um, I was looking and I was surprised. Dodge brand down 28% for the first quarter. So, Ooh, not good. Yeah. Not good at all. Hey, let's bring in Jim Hall. Who? Howdy. I. <laughs> it's been a while. So, yeah, there he goes. He, he froze up on us or yeah. made it seem like he had. Um, so Jim, yeah, Marlin, uh, was 1965. Oh, was it really that? Yeah, 65 model year. It was the classic Marlin. Then the AMC Marlin, Rambler Marlin 65, MC Marlin 66 and 67. The last year they built it off of the, uh, ambassador wheelbase got longer and the roof actually looked better because it was less hunchback because the car was longer. Because as you know, any car longer looks great. This is why we have you on the show for all this ah. minutia. Now it's been a number of years. You went to work for General Motors. I did and, go to work for General Motors. And you've just retired from there. And what was the last thing you were doing there? I was director of design strategy. Which means? Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Agarian theorem. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and, and for all of you who are listening to the podcast, um, Mr. Hall was gesticulating and his mouth was moving, but no words were coming out. Yes, but uh, that was not a fault of any technical issue whatsoever. Oh, that was just Jim Hall. Synapse, a, a synapse uh, technical issue and, and <laughs> an inability to talk a lot about the job. <laughs> well, whatever. It's great to have yeah. you back on the show. It's good to be back. And let's bring on our, our other guest here, Carl Ludvigsen. 
in from hey, London. How you doing? Nice, to, well, nice to hear you. Nice to be here. Carl, London. it's great to have you back on the show. Thank you. So, and, Carl, did, did you have the answer to these questions? No, no, I'm afraid I didn't. I It, it was an interesting <clears throat> point for me, though, because uh, when the Mustang was introduced, I was working for GM uh, Overseas Operations in Manhattan uh, as a public, uh, you know, press press guy <clears throat> representing uh, GM, and of course we had a reasonably snazzy um, uh, display at the World's Fair out out in New in the uh, in the uh, in the New York. Uh, uh, area and uh, of course Ford was there too and they made a big splash there at the World's Fair with the Mustang when they launched it so I, I remember that vividly <laughs> we didn't have anything quite like that uh, and Ford did score a coup um, with that uh, that launch at that time it was a great place to do it that's right Carl you know so our viewers might know uh, We'll be talking about a whole bunch of things and your knowledge will come out in the course of the show, but can you give us a, a quick thumbnail of what you've done in your career? Mm, well, let's say about um, uh, six years in the corporate life with GM, uh, Ford and Fiat, six to seven years. Um, a, a period of about uh, two years editing um, Car and Driver magazine um, uh, a, a spell of about uh, 11 years in the 70s when I was uh, a freelance writer, um, 15 years in London uh, running a management consulting company working in the motor industry, um, and, and uh, a substantial company, about a dozen people with interesting jobs to do for uh, companies all around the world. And then from uh, 2000 and 2001 to thereabouts on, I've been back uh, writing articles and books and doing research and the odd uh, uh, consulting job. So it's it's been an interesting uh, life uh, concentrated on uh, automobiles, and and I've always kind of defaulted to the automobile position. Uh, when I was at Car and Driver, they wanted me to be a publisher. I said, "No, no, no! I don't, I don't want to. That, that, that. You have to do things that I don't want to do in that job." And uh, you know, I've always looked for jobs that keep me close to cars and uh, g allow me to make a contribution in the world of uh, automobiles. So I've, I've had a, a mixed, a mixed brew of uh, different responsibilities, uh, which I, I now as a, as a, as an author, I, I think that that history. It gives me a little bit of understanding of what goes on in the industry. So when I'm writing about uh, things that happen in the industry, I can interpret them with a with a bit of inside knowledge, uh, especially at Ford. Ford certainly, I was a vice president at uh, Ford of Europe, responsible for their motorsports and um, governmental affairs activities, uh, which is an interesting portfolio. And it, uh, it, it gave me uh, a, a great, and I was on all the senior committees, of course, at Ford, and that uh, gave me a great appreciation from the inside of how a car company uh, operates at, at a quite high level. You're uh, a, quite a prolific author. I, I hazard to guess there's more than a few of your own books on the bookshelf behind you. Well, there are. The, to the top shelf <laughs> along there is pretty much most of my work. <laughs> but the big news is my new book. <laughs> That's the one I came on to talk about, which uh, uh, is Carl Ludwigson's Fast Friends. Thank you very much. Uh, there's a German version of it all, which, uh, of it also, which is Carl Ludwigson's uh, rearview mirror. Uh, they, it, it's better in in the German, <laughs> if I could put it that way. Uh, the idea was to uh, uh, write uh, biographies of people that I've known and worked with in the automobile world, and it's divided up into engineers. Uh, designers, uh, car guys, uh, drivers, racers, and uh, uh, executives. So there's a wide spectrum of the individuals that I've worked with. I've tried to put in that their character, their, their, their style, 
uh, what contributions they made to the industry and how they did it. What, what, what are the things that they did that were constructive and what, what was their, well, their way of going about uh, their uh, activity. And then I also put my dad in because he, <laughs> he, he got me started. Uh, he was an executive first of Fuller Manufacturing Company and then Eaton Corporation, and he became ultimately the chairman of Eaton. And uh, I, he, I always kind of followed along what he was doing when he was at Fuller. I'd go down to the shop with him on a Saturday, and uh, we'd look through the place, and uh, I'd look through his, his magazines that he was getting and uh, so forth and so on. And that, that, that was a big leg up in terms of having a passion for uh, automobiles uh, so uh, I and 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 to my <laughs> eternal credit if I may say so I managed to sit him down and interview him <laughs> I, I said I said to myself that I'll, I'll just if, if I don't interview my father <laughs> about his career in the industry I, I'll be making a huge mistake and uh, I, it's a mistake I didn't make I'm happy to say so I, I had a lot of great quotes about it, about what he did, why he did it, how he did it. Uh, in, it it's the opening story in the book. Uh, so that's it. Carl Ludvigson's Fast Friends. Uh, keep, a, keep an eye out for that. And, uh, and, and I, I think you'll find it an enjoyable read. People have, some people have complained about it. They said, oh, I, where is all the technical stuff? <laughs> Doesn't Carl write about technical stuff? Isn't that a, what he writes about? And uh, I, 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 it isn't. I've, I've done six or seven books about racing drivers, and uh, you know, I've, I've written the, the biography of Reed Railton, and so I'm not, I'm not <laughs> just a technical guy. And I guess I'm trying to show that in the, uh, in uh, the book as well. Well, Carl, who are some of the other people that are in the book? Um, people like John DeLorean. Um, I. I I got a little criticism, I wouldn't call it a criticism, a comment that, well, gee, he's being awfully nice to John. And it's only because so much crap has been written about John. Uh, I uh, really felt I needed to, to, to write the balance a little bit and emphasize the, the great things that he did in the car industry, uh, which uh, I, I worked with him as a consultant for a while and so on. So I know John pretty well. Um, uh, Emerson Fittipaldi, Mario Andretti, uh, uh, Juan Fangio, um, uh, Giorgetto uh, Giugiaro, um, uh, Tony Lapine uh, of uh, GM and Porsche fame, um, uh, Perry Porsche, his uh, sister uh, as well. Um, uh, Albrecht Gertz, who designed the BMW 507, was a, was a very good friend of mine in New York. Um, uh, let's see, who else? Uh, Bob Lutz, of course, who, with whom I work very closely on a number of occasions. Um, uh, uh, let's see, who else? Uh, anyway, that's a, that's a, that's a start. <laughs> of the, it is. So ju just so everybody knows, I bought the book and I read it and I really enjoyed reading it. There's maybe a handful of people that I knew as well, but I learned so much more about them reading the book. And it really captures an era that's gone right now in the industry of what was going on in the 50s, the 60s, 70s, 80s. Um, and it does it, as you say, Carl, not through going through all the technical, this, that, or other things, but the people, the people that you interviewed. And and make them come alive and tell some of their stories. And uh, so I, I highly recommend it to anybody who's looking for a good book to read about the automotive industry. Thank you very much, John. In fact, why don't you, I, I, you know, I, I thought having Jim Hall here and Gary's totally into design and you're into design, we should talk a lot about design today. But maybe you can kick off the conversation, Carl, because you tell a great story about Bill Mitchell in the book where you're, and I'm going to set the stage and then you take it from there, but you guys were sort of tasked, I believe, if I remember this right, of figuring out where Volkswagen was going next. It was selling something like half a million Beatles in the U.S. market every year, something that it's even today nowhere near close to coming to achieving. GM and Bill Mitchell in particular really didn't like the Beatle, didn't want to, you know, even deal with it. But you guys had to come and make him a presentation. I've set the stage. You take it from there. 
Uh, that's that's exactly right. Uh, Bill just could not understand why people were interested in this car. Uh, and I worked very closely. I was in sort of his PR aide for three or four years. And uh, I wrote speeches for Bill. And uh, so uh, he and I were, were quite close in a way. And, and but he, he did not uh, he did not get the Volkswagen at all. And the story I tell in the book is actually uh, one uh, uh, described by a chap named Stefan Habsburg. Stefan Habsburg was a very close friend of mine from college years at MIT. And, uh, and afterwards, he and I worked in the same studio at Styling in 1956 and uh, one thing and another. But uh, Stefan uh, got involved uh, through Ken Pickering at Styling Staff on, in, on, 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 on a concept to try and explain to Bill why the Volkswagen <laughs> was as it was and uh, where it might go, uh, where, where might its future be. And uh, they did it by setting up a, uh, a, a, a kind of faux uh, uh, debate uh, room in which Bill was invited, but he was told, you're not going to just dash in and out here. You're going to sit down for an hour and a half, and we're going to show you something that we think you'll find interesting. <laughs> and this is not easy to do, but he, they, 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 they said, uh, this is what you must do, Bill. And he said, okay, okay. <laughs> and uh, uh, they, they, um, uh, so, so they had tags in front of them with their names and so on. Several people were giving this presentation. And uh, once Bill was settled, they, they tipped the, the main nameplates over and showed titles of executives at Volkswagen. And uh, from that, they went into the discussions that a kind of Volkswagen group would be having about why they're going to do this, what were they going to do, and what's their plan, and how, how they're going to uh, operate, and so forth, and, and telling it as they would, as, 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 as Stefan knew they would, and as the, our, our chaps had, had worked out that they would, which was, and, and Bill came away from the meeting he stayed for the whole thing and he said uh, he said golly you guys have opened my eyes to this uh, this is described quite fully in the book uh, you've opened my eyes to this situation I, uh, I understand a lot more now about why this is happening and what what's going on and uh, and he said I want to show I want you to show that to Chuck Jordan I want Herbert Bicky and you know all the top guys to get this same presentation because it's so uh, enlightening and uh, interesting. Uh, it was a very unusual experience for Bill. <laughs> I, 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 I thought uh, well worth uh, 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 reporting in the book, uh, in, the, in my biography of Stefan, who is not a well-known person in the industry. Uh, deserves to be better known, and that's why I uh, I put him in the book because uh, he had an interesting story to tell. I'm I'm embarrassed to tell you that I have uh, right down here in the drawer uh, a complete and in, and on, and in in the uh, computer a, a a a complete story that Stefan has written about his life altogether. And when I talk about Habsburg, he is a Habsburg or was a Habsburg. I mean he his his mother was a queen of Romania and you know things like that. So uh it, it's a colorful life uh, uh by any standard and uh I'm you know I have a lot of un <laughs> un unrealized projects and this is one of them. I would love to tell Stefan's complete story. Uh, however, I was very pleased to have this little niche uh, uh, item about uh, about Bill Mitchell uh, styling. You know, uh, the 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 one thing that uh, I always uh, felt was uh, remarkable about Bill Mitchell was that if you think about the period of the uh, '60s when he really got into gear, um, he could encourage uh, designers to work in a number of different parallel schools of design that were quite different, completely different. I mean, uh, you know, you'd had the Chevrolet Monte Carlo, you had the Buick Riviera, the old Toronado. These are entirely different concepts of 
cars, completely different. There's no commonality at all. Uh, and, and each is good. Each is a very interesting and valid school of design. Uh, it was a unique uh, uh, capability in the history of the auto, auto industry. Uh, and of course, of course, they still had divisions in those days. <laughs> and, and the divisions wanted to be, have, have differences. They wanted to stand out and have, have a particular difference for their, their products. So uh, that, that uh, helped uh, you know, emphasize the great strength of uh, GM's internal competitiveness. And it was always the studios, under the, were, the studios yep. were also uh, very compartmentalized. For example, if you worked in a Chevy studio and you went in a Buick studio, you could be fired. Amen to that. <laughs> no, that's it, right. It, it was it was key access. It was not card access, and you had a key for your studio. Yep. Yep. And literally, you did not cross that line because that was a dismissible offense. So that was one thing that helped keep it separate. The other one was Bill could look at clays from for different brands. And he wouldn't sit here and find something he likes, and then it would, would subconsciously appear on other vehicles. That happened with his successors. Yes, and yes, you're right. He, yeah. he could look at that, and a, a, for example, the best way to put it is a great line on a Buick is wrong on a Chevy. And he, he saw it, and he had everybody at the studios understanding, this is your lane. You can go and do whatever you want. And if you think about it, the, the Tornado, which is a vehicle for which I am especially fond. Because you own one. The, one. <laughs> because I own one, yeah. Um, but but the, the, the Tornado was one of those vehicles that, that came out of nowhere. If you think about it, the design of the 63 Chevy Corvette Stingray was telegraphed with the 1959 Corvette Stingray race car and a bunch of concept cars they would do in between, the 715 Shark and so on. But the Toro, there was nothing that they did as a show car that led up to it. And it was an oh my God moment when it came out. Conversely, its best sales of the first generation car were the first year. Because everybody wanted a car that pushed that far, bought one. And the market, the natural market for the car was a fraction of what they thought. But remember, that was that was Olds taking a serious shot at the Thunderbird. Yes. yes everybody sure. was going for a personal luxury car, sort of a personal yep. coupe. And they wouldn't let Pontiac have a dedicated vehicle. So Pontiac had to effectively take a Bonneville and turn it into a Grand Prix with a new roof line, backlight, mm -hmm. and stuff. So that was sort of an in-between. The first of the GM cars was the Rivi in 63, the Riviera, which again was a standalone platform. They wouldn't even think about doing it now. Then they just did it. But that's another one where the brand thing is weird because Mitchell saw that car originally as a Cadillac. Oh, yeah. Well, he is. it was called a LaSalle when it was right. under development and, in Ned Nichols' studio. Uh, they no, used and, and the LaSalle code right. name. And, and, he and had he, no, Cadillac had no interest in it. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And they they put it up. They it was available to to all the top divisions. And uh, mm -hmm. Buick said, "We'll we'll have that. Thank you very much." Uh, which which was great. I well, of course, my respect for that car is is limitless. I just think there isn't a thing on it that isn't essential. It really was fantastic. Although there's a story um, no about that early on after Buick had it, when the, the the product planners were in there and they're asking, where are the portholes going to go? The Veniports? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah and and yeah. it wasn't going to happen. It was not going to no, happen, but they didn't no. understand that. Yeah. So there's a story that they put some on a clay when they came in and looked at it, peeled them off. They were never on it again. That's wonderful. <laughs> Carl, no, to go I, the, back tornado, to the tornado, just to uh, to mention the tornado, I agree about the concept of the tornado. Uh, Jack Jack Belts. I was thinking about Jack Belts the other day. It's something yeah. I was writing. I mean, what a guy! I mean, a, a tremendous character, personality, and, and engineer. But uh, styling stubbed their toe on the uh, Toronado, in the sense that they predicted that was going to sweep the market. That's going to be the winner of this this little group of cars, uh, but yep. it wasn't. It wasn't. Yep. The, the Riviera was, uh, right. in fact, uh, in that in that iteration so they they're they 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 weren't good at uh, <laughs> saying you know uh, approving what they thought should should sell well it, it sold it, it's, as you say it sold well in the first year but uh, and, and then of course it never looked as good again no <laughs> everything they did to it was that was, was a retrograde was, step. Was, was was terrible yeah exactly so Carl, uh, Carl, go back to your story though i mean so what was mitchell's response to the beetle and and to Jim, why was the Beetle so successful 
and and why has there never really been a second act for that company? Well, in, uh, in, in America, yeah, I can't say that's a, that, that the second act in America is a, is a, is a tough uh, question. I haven't thought about that for a while, but the, uh, the, the, interestingly, the way they presented the uh, uh, product in this uh, presentation pointed toward the Gulf five years later. I mean, they, they, they had really anticipated when they were discussing what it should be, what the next Volkswagen should be, and so on. Uh, they, they pinpointed the five years later launch of the Gulf. So it was, uh, it was a very knowledgeable uh, presentation. I, 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 I don't think it triggered any uh, particular reaction in, uh, in a Bill. But that just reminds me, um, you know, when when uh, British uh, British Motors, uh, I don't think it was British Leyland yet. They when they brought out the kind of maxi look, the very long, uh, elongated bodies of, of cars, the maxi, the, uh, the 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 big Austins and so on. There was they, when they had they had transverse front engines, and the rest of the car was very big. It was in the Alex uh, uh, Isagonis period, you know, have it big on the inside. The hell was who cares what it looks like on the outside? Um, uh, Jim Roach, uh, when he was president, uh, said, Bill, I'd like you guys to take a, a, a swing at that package. I'd like you to see what you can come up with and design a car that's this, that's that's designed like that with uh, this big interior and, uh, you know, stuff stuck on the front and back and so on. I think I, 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 I Luckily, I wasn't present because I wouldn't like to have known what Mitchell would have thought about that idea. Carl, um, I contend that's the citation. The X car was that yeah, car. Yeah, yeah. Well, 1980, it and it had Mitchell's hand yeah. in it. Mm -hmm. Oh, sure, sure it yeah. did. Of course it did. Yeah, yeah. No, it didn't quite. Uh, the, the timing. You know, the X car had a little bit of that, didn't it? Mm -hmm. It did, Jim. You're right. The X-Car, in some ways, they, they were doing early engineering mules, and they were using Lancia Betas. Apparently, one year, they sold a lot of Lancias in Michigan, and GM That's bought right. them. So they could <laughs> get them and slice and dice them. Yeah. But early on, that, that, that was a program that, in many ways, is prototypical of what's happened in the industry as a whole. They were trying to add technology, but build it for a price. Yes. And as a result, right. there are things that were common sense solutions that were additional sense solutions. So early on, the X car had the radiator in the fender well like a Mini Cooper did, an mm -hmm. original Mini. Yep. And it breathed. The air was actually for the for the radiator was coming into the wheelhouse. And they were doing some winter testing with it. And apparently they had two cars that were overheating up in Kappa's casing. And it was like minus 15 degrees. And they couldn't figure out why until they looked. And it was all the ice impingement in the wheel well. And the radiator was literally three inches behind it. And it got no air. Wow. So wow. what was the solution? We've got to spend extra money and put an electric fan yep. on it. Yep. I mean, yeah. that's that, that, that was one of those things where um, the, the technology has a cost, but it's rarely seen as an investment in the future or a new product. It's seen simply as a cost because that's the way finance works. Yes. Tough one. And no, that, that's right. I mean, the uh, uh, when I was with Ford of Europe, um, uh, I'm, I'm, uh, uh, we, we, uh, we didn't, we didn't really learn a lesson. We, we, I mean, of course, uh, several themes come to mind, but one of them, one of them was that once we launched the car, we got busy taking cost out of it. And uh, that was, a, a, that was a, just a Ford thing you did. I mean, there's no, I don't think we weren't, a special group of Ford people doing this. This was a Ford thing. You, when 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 we launched the car, the next thing we did was think, where can we take money out of it? And of course, that's not the way to proceed. <laughs> you end yeah, up because you, you, some you, of the you, you think you can where can we, you should be thinking about where can we put value in it uh, and at the least cost. Let's say uh, there are other ways to approach it. Uh, and in some that, cases, you take away something that drove people to that that appealed to the people to make the change to get the car to begin with. Yep, that that yep. happens more often than people want to admit. And it's like, oh yeah, we took that out, and they're like, didn't customers like that? We yep. took yeah. it out for money. We're more <laughs> profitable now. Yet, yeah. yet there's a natural profitability curve with every car because your investment is front loaded. 
So after the investment is paid down partway through the run, the mm -hmm. profitability is higher, even though the volume's down, the unit yep. profitability is higher. So they're making the most money usually in the last year or two. Yep. Yep. Hey yeah, guys, I, I got to jump in. Oh, we got to take a quick commercial break. I want to come back to Gary's question to you, Jim, about the beetle when we come back and we'll be okay. back in just a jiffy. All right, we're back. And yeah, I, I thought Gary's question was really good. Why, why was Volkswagen so successful with the Beetle? Understand and the why was it not able to replicate that again? The context that created the Beetle no longer existed. That's problem number one. Remember, the Beetle was created using bleeding edge uh, engineering concepts of the time when it was engineered, pre-war. And it was heavily influenced by a certain uh, Czech individual that also was responsible for vehicles like Tatras? No, not true. Is not he not checked? true. Not true. It was not influenced by Ch uh, Ledvinka and his Tatras. They weren't even his Tatras. They were designed by another guy. Uh, but right, that's but the, the thing is, the point. The, the, that philosophy of, of aerodynamics, rear engine, and what you can yeah. do with a car was part of the thinking of the car. I'm not saying that they, you couldn't look at what you were doing with the Beetle and not realize you were doing things they had done there. But, but the point is, it was the context of that's how the car was created. And then the car went on sale when the assumptions for it were really no longer valid, but it was tooled and it was cheap. So it was successful in Europe. It was, an, it was a Model T for Europe. That's part one. Remember, until the Beetle uh, came out, the largest selling car ever produced was the Model T. Amen. And the Model T had very few changes over its life cycle, not unlike the Beetle. The Beetle had changes, and there were some significant ones, but it, the architecture was effectively the same until they did the Super Beetle. So here's a car they just kept building. It was well past its shelf life in Europe when it was hitting its peak in the United States. Because in the United States, we didn't have that thing. Beetles reminded Americans of good times when they were kids and their first car. Beetles reminded Germany at that time of the bad old days. So... The, the reason by which the Beetle was successful didn't exist by the time, by, by, by basically the early 70s, because Europe was motorized. There were cars available for almost every person pocket over there. Now, there were things like Cinquecentos, the original 500. They were very small cars. Dercheval, which is also pre-war, but kept on because it was remarkably French. I would contend that for the context of the day, Gary, the Golf was the Beetle. For the context of the day, a more competitive market, more advanced technology, more ubiquity in the technology in cars. They just very cleverly put it all together. You know, the, there's an argument the Golf did less than the original Mini did because its suspension system was rather prosaic by comparison to the Minis. Okay, so, so let me... Well, let me, yeah, let me, let me I'd, I'd, I'd say that the, uh, the, uh, the Golf... The Golf you know, it came a little late-ish, but, uh, right. but, but it came just, just barely in time. And uh, and and it, it was a, a, a quite a successful car, of course, in its way. And we we still have golfs. I mean, they they've managed to keep that franchise alive uh, ever since uh, Jujaro's first uh, effort. Uh, he he says in, the, in in my book, he says I I had three months to do the 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 golf, the Scirocco, and one other car, I can't remember what it was. It was, <laughs> the, the, it yeah. was the Passat, wasn't it? Yeah, the, there was another Passat, exactly. So they, yeah. they, they launched this whole group of cars, and he said, I had three, I had three months to do it. And, and this just shows how valuable it can be to not have very much time to do something because <laughs> there's not, it's not messed about. Yeah. It's not messed about. They're <laughs> clear, sharp cars. They're really good. So I think one of the problems with design is there's a point at which you're supposed to lift the pen and walk away. That's right. Though and sometimes instead, that doesn't happen. <laughs> no, they just keep sketching and keep going yeah. and it's being optimized and it's actually being overdone. And yeah. this is, I, it's my contention. This is now the common way cars are designed. And I would suggest it's because of the design tools that designers are using. It's digital. Can I just you make don't a like comment? <laughs> yeah. Can I just make a comment? Yeah. Can I make a comment about the Beetle? Um, uh, as, as you well know, and I've written a book about it, um, the, uh, the, the, the company was eventually turned over by the British army 
to the uh, nation of Germany and the, the region in which it was uh, uh, housed. And, uh, and Heinz Nordhoff was already in place as the, the leader. The, the, the British had, had picked him to be in charge of Volkswagen. And my, uh, and, and, and of course, he got a lot of advice. And, and the first advice he got was, you've got to change the looks of that car. It's totally uh, associated with Hitler, with the Nazis, with the Third Reich, uh, the whole deal. It's, a, it's appalling. It's ancient. It's, it's dated. It's dated. It's from the 30s. It's not, uh, you know, that was a big period. Of, no, no, you've got to change the looks of the car. Uh, and and th then it'll be, in, you, then you'll be fine. And uh, he said, mm, he said, I think we have, we have a good, a good dog here. It has a lot of fleas at the moment, but if we get rid of those fleas, this dog will run for us very well. And he did not change anything about the appearance of the Volkswagen. And in my view, this is the most important decision that, Nordhoff ever made uh, in his career, uh, because uh, having made that decision, that's exactly what happened. They got in gear, they started to improve it, make it better and better in every way, and uh, and uh, then people said, "Well, this is this is okay. Uh, it's it's rugged. It's um, it 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 was designed to run at top speed all day long, <laughs> which was a, a good philosophy." Uh, and uh, and it worked. So I'm inversely, though, the concept is the thing that almost broke Volkswagen, because they couldn't do a new car without doing a flat, a horizontally opposed rear engine. I mean, they did. There was a Porsche proposal for a replacement for the Beetle. I think it was I think it was EA six one three, but I'm not sure. It used an L four engine in the rear. It was mid mid engine. It was laid over on its side and under the rear seat. Oh yeah, oh yeah. It was well, a brilliant that was package. Hey, it was that a was package, but, it, but it was not Nordhoff. That's my point. Yeah. Nordhoff kept wanting to do these. There, I mean, the port, the Volkswagen Museum in Ingolstadt is amazing, where they have this giant, almost Chevelle-sized car with a flat six hanging out of the rear and a bench seat and a column shift. And that was what they thought they needed for America. And they didn't. Um, wow. the, the, who was the man behind the um, the Golf at Volkswagen that decided to use the, uh, the Audi powertrain for it? It was Rudolf oh. Lighting. Rudolf Lighting. Rudolf, Rudolf, Rudolf Lighting is a man who created the the golf and uh, and Chirac Lighting is the guy that saved the company. Oh yeah, literally, Definitely. he saved that company. Yep. And and that's the thing when you the, this is the problem. In fact, we were having a discussion about this some, uh, about when is it time to actually do new, where you throw out whatever heritage is and you just do new for the market. And this is a question in my mind that's facing General Motors and everybody that's making a big commitment to electric right now. And it's it's a significant question because it gets into design, it gets into marketing, it gets into every aspect of the product. Now, they all know it's, it's engineering, but the other parts of it, it's hard for big companies to change. And that's why Volkswagen got so close to the edge because they kept pushing on an idea that was based on 1930s assumption of product and the world had changed around them. But they, I mean, I, you, you, I think I, I'm not sure about the edge. Uh, uh, um, where, 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 where were they? They, they were, they were, uh, they were, they were, uh, I guess they, they were court, economically court. in trouble yeah. in, in yeah. 1969, 70, they were in big trouble, Carl. Yeah. And they had yeah. done, they'd done crazy they things had, like buying NSU. Brilliant. All right. So I, yeah. I want to change this up a little bit here. Let's, let's, let's go away from Volkswagen. <laughs> And, and, and here's my question to, again, Carl and Jim. Um, do you think that American design circa right now is best expressed in pickup trucks and muscle cars? Well, Silence. It's, uh, it's certainly a dominant in big pickups my god <laughs> nobody does a big pickups like america i mean uh the dodge uh, oh my god they these things are are awesome um uh, and and uh, and uh, musk's uh, interpretation is is the re reverse <laughs> he's, he's he's taken a wholly different approach to do, to the, the the pickup concept but but the uh, yeah, I think I think the guys do a hell of a job in uh, in in creating imposing looking 
uh, uh, pickups and uh, giant uh, SUVs for sure in America. Uh, the the uh, Japanese, Koreans, Chinese chase after them, but uh, they're hard to match. Gary, you said the best American design. I would say the largest American design is on pickups and full-size SUVs, not yeah. the best. <laughs> well, it I think is it's not the best. The best it is not the best work that's coming out of the American studio. Well, okay, it oh, okay. I'm, I can I can see that point, but it's the best work for its purpose, in my view. Oh, that's, it's it's, it's successful. It's purpose. It's successful for its purpose. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah. Bear in mind though, the concept of good design, first of all, is so irritatingly subjective. I mean, I know it, what it is, and none of you guys do. Okay. <laughs> but, <laughs> but 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 the point is that it's so subjective, and and the thing is, sometimes the best design on a car is on something that doesn't sell. It just doesn't get noticed, and that's that's worldwide. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Because there, there's a thing I I am very fond of the concept of classical beauty of a vehicle, which has to do with proportion and surface. Now it doesn't mean it has to be a big car, but it means that these things have to be cohesive cohesive together. So it isn't simply a nicely proportioned car and it looks like it was halfway designed, or it is, it's beautifully surfaced, but God, those overhangs are bad and the tires don't feel anything. It's the combo of the two, and it doesn't have to be a specific size. So okay. Jim, let's talk electric cars. Don't you think there's a, a almost a clean sheet opportunity here for the industry? Absolutely. The, 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 the point is with electric, you could use electric, a, a major company, General Motors, Ford, Chrysler, uh, Volkswagen, they could use electric to completely reset a brand and redefine I think, it. I think a good example is Porsche. Uh, I, I've seen a lot of reviews of the Taycan in which people have said, oh, well, you know, they've used Porsche Qs and so on. Like hell they have. The Taycan is an absolutely clean sheet of paper piece of design that is fantastically good. I mean, it's I think it's profile. tremendously good. It's fantastically it's, good. I'm not uh, saying it isn't, but in, in profile, it's a Porsche, and it is well, only a Porsche. Yeah, you could, well, ELO. You, I, the point is, <laughs> yeah, that, okay. that's the thing. Is that a cue, or is that a philosophy? And this is, is this it, whole thing with design. Yeah, is, is, it, yeah. is it, are you using a series of cues to define what your brand is? Because after a while, you will turn into a Mr. Potato Head car, and I know that's not politically correct anymore, but you are a Ms. Potato Head car. You would turn it into that if all you're using is cues because you're sticking stuff on. Mm -hmm. yeah. Porsche is interesting because Porsches have had a rather um, sophisticated and elegant form language and proportion because of the kinds of cars they are. That's why I would suggest the least successful Porsche of the recent era is the first generation Cayenne and the first generation Panamera. They yes, were both, they, 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 they were struggled. clumsy cars. They, they struggled. They struggled. Yep. They did. Yeah. Yep. Jim, but to go back to John's point, so, you know, this this possibility of, of reestablishing what a brand represents, how a brand looks, how a brand is is perceived by the by the market. I mean, do you see, you know, coming out of out of studios, whether it's in the United States or or Korea or Japan or Europe? I mean, are companies doing this or are they just sort of saying, yeah, we could probably do that. But, you know, that's a little risky. You know, the Kia that they uh, they they dropped the pictures on, what was it, day before yesterday? The EV6. Yeah. Go look at that and tell me what on it is Kia design philosophy you've seen before. It's new. It's new and it's pretty fresh. So, I mean, yes, you can, Gary. And they did on that car. The question is whether they'll try to create two parallel paths, an EV path and an IC path with the same brand, which to me is potentially pointless. And I know the arguments for and against rebranding a car. It's expensive. It's really expensive. But if you do it right with the right product, you have none of the baggage the other brand has. It's gone. Now, you have to create new baggage or at least something somebody wants to put their lunch in and go to work with. But it's possible to do it. It necessitates a level of business commitment now, though, that most car companies are really not very comfortable with. Because understand, the investment that's being made on these EVs you're throwing away effectively all of your foundries and engine plants. They're, they're, you're going you're gonna to use them. You're going to repurpose oh, yeah. them. But what they do, you can't use anymore. So the, the commitment to this is one where they have to feel as comfortable as possible in changing their business paradigm. And there is the dichotomy of world business today. Startups can do it because they don't have the luxury 
of heritage. They don't have the luxury of investment. Unfortunately, everybody that does have that luxury is burdened by it. And everybody, because you see it at Volkswagen, you do see it at, at Hyundai Kia Group in that they have some of their electrics where they can't pull the pin. Um, you know, they're having a hell of a time with Genesis. They're trying to create a new brand. And the funny thing about brand new brand creation is there's a primer written on it by Toyota. And you can look at what Mr. Uh, Musk is doing and also see about cre creation of brands and an automotive, automotive space. Okay, let's take is, another... We have to take another quick commercial break. We're going to come right back. Carl, hold on to that. We'll come to that in a second. But first, uh, another shout out to our good sponsor, Magna. All right, we're back. And, and Carl, you were holding something up that you were going to make a point about. What was that? It's uh, the open, it's the front uh, 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 opening of the uh, Guild of Motoring Writers uh, annual uh, yearbook, which just arrived today. And what's in there? A Genesis, uh, a Genesis uh, ad for the, the, in the uh, first flyleaf of the book. So it's interesting. They are they are trying to uh, make a make a bit of an impact and uh, 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 get people's attention. And of course, this is a uh, a part of the world where uh, infinity has vanished. You right. know, uh, infinity has pulled out of uh, of Europe uh, pretty much. And uh, this is well, the rest pretty this, much this the rest is, of the world. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I, I reckon, and uh, uh, it's interesting. I. I, I for about three years, I mean, I was trying to convince the uh, Infinity people that what they needed was a good book about the Infinity story. You know, what was what? How did it begin? What's its concept? You know, what went on? And what, what's what's Infinity all about? Because Europeans didn't really know, and they, if they had a nice book about it, they could show them. <laughs> so I had obvious <laughs> reasons for wanting to have this happen. Uh, but it got kicked from kicked from one person to another, and then they said, well, and "Of course, by by that time, it, it, it vanished." So, uh, and, and they weren't giving much attention to things like their their brand identity and why it was important to to have uh, infinity in the in the world of cars. And of course, Part of when that. they when they launched, they did. Well, but the they infinity, they did and they didn't. The, the, the infinity, infinity and Lexus, yeah, infinity that, and Lexus it, had a common right. problem. They were well, not. In promoted was, ex, it, they were on. not home they were not home market products yeah the, the, the infinity products were nissans the lexus yes. products were toyotas the toyota celsius was the was the lexus ls because they didn't live in the home market it was a remote decision whenever it got brought up it wasn't relevant to us i mean no matter what you say that that i mean Toyota is a Japanese car company where the product planning decisions, the strategic business decisions are being made in the context of guys going to work in Japan, to, in Japan every day. The same is true for Hyundai Kia. The same is true for Fiat or was same, the same for Fiat. It was the same for Renault at one time. And Renault still is, but they're all done in a context. Throw that context away and you end up with things that you say, well, this brand is not relevant for our market. Think about it. That's effectively what almost happened to Buick. All right. So explain that to me because I'm, I'm like, I'm looking at the sales numbers right now and I see that for the uh, first quarter, Cadillac sold 37,000 cars in the United States. Uh, Lincoln sold 25,000 and change and Lexus sold 74,000 and change. So we could add the two domestic brands and we're not even near Lexus and you're suggesting Jim that they're an outlier somehow from an ad from the standpoint of and Lexus is a part of Toyota and how Cadillac's Toyotas part of sell? General Motors how much yeah. how many Toyotas <laughs> did they sell that month last month 603,000 which is up 21.6 percent and how many Lexuses 74 
Yet the Toyota is a global product. That's my point. It is a no, I mean, global talking product. about domest domestic. I know sales. that, but I'm talking about the decision making for brands is done within context. What were the sales of uh, Cadillac in China last month? I don't know. You should look at those numbers. Yeah, well, they were more than in the U.S. for sure. For exactly. Sure. Yeah, I'm probably yeah. right. That, that the yeah. centroids have all changed, but the, the the problem is, do you do you try to do a global? I mean, think of it. What's a world car? A BMW 3 Series is a world car. In every market it's sold, it has effectively the same product position and image. It doesn't change. But it's a German car. That's a world car. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Carl, I want to go back to uh, you brought up the, the Tesla Cybertruck. Gary had asked about, you know, is yep. full size pickups the, the epitome of American design? What do you make of that Cybertruck? And what do you think about all these startups? You know, to, to Jim's point, they don't well, have I, to worry yeah. about anything. They can do something totally bold and different. But why don't you kick it off with talking about the Cybertruck? Yes, uh, they 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 can, and uh, but but they haven't really done that with their uh, with their cars. I mean, the cars are are blando cars. I mean, they're 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 a little little swish here and a little just there. But uh, what about Rivian? Is Rivian interesting? Have, the, the, they've they've produced some vehicles that look look good. But different, uh, and it, I'm kind of intrigued by that. I like the way they've tackled that. They haven't sold any cars yet, though. Uh, yeah. They're not really started, mm -hmm. and it's it's one of the one of the one of the problems with EVs is uh, pretty basic. That when you start, you have the luxury, for one of a better term, of um, saying the thing gets whatever range you want, and it's whatever you want to do. Because in a lot of cases, these things are still pushmobiles. Yep, mm -hmm. and Okay. It's when the when the rubber hits the road and you have to sell them is is where you get into issues. The interesting thing, I mean, you're absolutely right. Outside the Teslas are not especially; they don't break any ground from a design standpoint. Have you seen the new interiors on the facelift of the of the Model S with the no. steering yoke instead of a steering wheel? Oh golly! Oh, and, 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 <laughs> Carl, it, it it's 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 the sketch everybody did in des, in design doing super advanced yep. interiors for show cars about a year ago. They're, yep. they're going to do it, they say. Yeah. And so, you know, that's this whole philosophy. They they have a problem. In a way, they're Apple. Apple cannot radically change the iPhone or the interface. They have too many users that expect it to work a certain way. They're people that want a Tesla to be like a Tesla, so it looks like a Tesla. Whether it looks modern or not, it's academic. It's a Tesla. Mm -hmm. If you think about it, it's the problem BMW and, and the luxury brands get into. Um, they, they narrow down what they can make them look like because people have a certain expectation of what a BMW is. Now, yes. Hoffmeister Knock is gone now, apparently. Yes, <laughs> yes, I think but, so, yes. But, and, but the thing and, is, to and, their buyers, they don't care. They're, that's not what they're looking at. And remember the excitement over a little hook, 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 hook watch a doozy in the, the boot at the tail, you know? I mean, they, oh, they, yeah. people, people went crazy. Uh, the BMW shouldn't have that funny, funny thing in the back. Uh, yep. But but they, they and, and, and right now over here, they're they're very upset about the big front end on the BMWs now. You know, it looks looks weird. They they can't get used to that. But but I I, I give the BMW people credit for keeping the concept and tweaking it this way and that way so that it still uh, carries a certain charisma. I'd say it's concern, very controversial over here too, Carl. Yeah, and I, I, I would I would say that uh, BMW's late to the party. The big gigantic grill thing, I think, has run its course, and they're just coming to the party now with the biggest grill on the block, Except and I think John, they're, they're going to grills. age very quickly. John, their big grills are all on their electrics too. I know, which I, grills, which I also graphic, think is a mistake. The graphic forms—they're using the form to identify the product, not the not the fact the fact of it. Yeah, I mean, it's almost like in a way, I, there's part of me, and I hate saying this, that thinks that. Design to a, an increasing number of buyers is less important than brand. Uh, isn't that, aren't they aren't they integral? I mean, isn't no. brand and design aren't they connected in some way? I don't think uh, so, uh, Jim. I think they are. I think they are. Yeah, connected. I, I'm with Carl on this. Uh, one. I, I, they brand and and uh, car. I mean, in, in fact, Vesta. going back to the cyber no, truck, you got to John E30 cyber truck. What about cyber truck? Cybertruck is going to bring people into the pickup segment who never even thought they wanted a pickup. They want to be seen 
in this Martian rock crawl yeah. called the Cybertruck. <laughs> yeah. They want everyone to see them in it. They may not even have liked Tesla or didn't see anything that Tesla offered for them. They are so going to be in that truck. John, I think you've got it exactly the wrong way around. <laughs> the people that will want it want a Tesla because they want a Tesla because Tesla is a serious luxury brand, especially on the West Coast. It is. It's significant. It is. It's relevant. There's a, there's a prestige about it. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. The, 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 the Cybertruck could be the Tornado. It goes yes. too far. Yes. Sure. Okay. And that's yeah. the thing. There's this fine line you walk where suddenly it's just goofy looking. It is just goofy looking. And understand, the production Cybertruck is not going to look like what you saw. You know that. It has to have some sort of drop glass. The body yes. break like that. You can't do a drop glass. That you can't, John. I'm sorry. You yeah, know, no. have to have something that passes for for the operational lighting in the front. It will no, undoubtedly. Right. Yes, that's true. It's going to need something called wipers. Yeah. All right. Yeah, seriously, it is literally that's a sketch they built fast, and it's cool. I loved it because we were involved in a project involving pickups, and I kept saying that you keep we keep trying to redefine traditional pickups for all sizes. That may not be the right thing to do. And this thing came out of left field, and it's like, put it in the clinic, guys. Yeah, no, well, no I, I, I totally I agree. Is, I, it's it could be. I have a feeling that it's so crazy that it's it's the appeal is going to be for somebody. I just want a Tesla. I want that. Yeah, it, I mean, if you, like, they're, they're not going to pull people out of their Silverados, F one fifties, or Rams. That's not I'm the not target. Even, it's I, I, totally, I know, totally new buyers into the segment. Yeah, I believe. Yeah, that if would there be are fun. those totally new buyers, see that's. That's the thing. I'm not sure. I, I'm, I'm serious that they, there's a finite number of trick pickup trucks that you can sell because some of the people that will think they want to pick up end up buying full size SUVs or large crossovers. But Jim, isn't it possible that people simply want to have a quirky Tesla? There are always people that want quirky products. Luckily. Saab lived on quirky <laughs> customers and quirky products. Let me see Saab. By the way, did you see the Saab press material for the 2022 Saabs, Gary? No, I didn't. No. <laughs> oh, Out, the outliers are outliers for a reason. Okay, I tend to love outliers, and this is why I know how irrelevant they can truly be. There's a core of every market, and this has to do with shoes. It has to do with eyeglasses. It has to do with food. And there's some people that simply don't want Evisto bug burgers. Yep. And they may when be we, good yeah. for the environment and, and taste fine. When we used to graph car images and brands, uh, according to different criteria, there was a consistent outlier, Alfa Romeo. Mm -hmm. Alfa Romeo just sat, you know, they were up in the graph up here somewhere and everybody else is down in, the, in this this end of the graph and Alpha is out there. Um, and, and, and I think that's one of the reasons why Alpha was so, has been so stuck with uh, a certain level of sales for so long because there are only X number of people who want that, that car out there in that outlying position. Now, uh, how they're 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 working hard to do something with Alfa Romeo now, and they're they're over here. They're 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 getting respect. I mean, the cars they are, are but the cars arguably, are standing up and they're working, and you know they 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 continue to run, which is a good but they're, feature. But they're, but they're chasing a vo another product that grossly outsells them. A they're chasing the three series with the Julia. The Julia is, for all intents and purposes, a three series for somebody who doesn't just want to get in line with everybody else. Well, that's not bad. That's a good no, idea. I, I'm saying that. I, I agree. <laughs> that's a good idea. Is, but, but if you look yeah. at that market and you look at the percent the 3 Series is in the segment, and then you look at all the products that are close to the 3 Series, and you realize Alpha is going to be out there for a long time until they do something that gets them attention that people want to buy because of what it is. Sure. Because they, they didn't. There's. I mean, I love the Julia, but other than the front end of that car, there isn't an original line on it. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Which is one yeah, of the reasons yeah. it has validity to some customers. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They, they got to, they've got to get that sorted. <laughs> they do. Yep. Uh, and now we've got uh, what's it called? Uh, Cintilla? What's it called? Uh, uh, Chinchilla? What's the name of this car you mean, company? You mean Stellantis? Oh, so Stellantis. That's it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. They're they're going to get that sorted, aren't they? Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. Well, <laughs> the the interesting thing with Alpha was that. Uh, or Kaiser Piek, I mean, uh, 
<laughs> Dr. Piek, Dr. Piek wanted to buy Alpha from Fiat on numerous occasions. He took a run at it. And every time he did, they said, what is he, the, the guys in Fiat were saying, what do they see that we don't? We better keep it. But they never stop and did a serious deep dive and say, what is its core equity? How is that core equity relevant in the, the, the second and third decades of the 21st century and optimize it for that. So they did a series of reactive cars. I mean, the, the, the Stelvio is really neat, but it is in a way a Macan. Yes, it is. With, yeah, it's, but it's not size. burdened with a Porsche yeah. brand. Sure, sure. Or Porsche no, pricing. They, yeah, I think Fiat. Fiat or Porsche bought, sales. Fiat bought uh, Alpha <laughs> because Ford was trying to buy it. Uh, yep. that's, that's, that's why they bought it. Uh, they bought it so that Ford wouldn't get it. Uh, that's, that's it clear and no question about it. Nothing uh, is more yeah. successful in the auto industry than defensive acquisitions. Yeah, that's right. I mean, that's right. God. Well, that, <laughs> that's, that's what's right. That's what's been going on. <laughs> Definitely. Uh, well, yeah. Hey, we, we've come to the top of the hour here. Um, we're going to have to wrap this up, but. Carl Ludvigsen, it's been a total pleasure having One you on the show. Look. One last, One last look. look at the book, <laughs> Fast Friends. Yeah. Carl Ludvigsen, you can buy it on Amazon, I believe. Right. Is it, isn't that right? I think that's where I bought it. Jim yeah. Hall, great having you back on the show, too. It's pleasure. great to be back, John. Well, well, we'll have to do it again. And Gary, you and I will just keep on doing this. Yes, we will. So thank okay. you, guys. Thank you. And I want to thank everybody for having tuned in. Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires, solutions for your journey, and by Magna. Visit our website, Autoline.tv, where you can watch us live Thursday afternoons. Get your daily fix with Autoline Daily and in depth analysis and interviews with Autoline This Week. There's all that and much more at Autoline.tv.